Hello, welcome everybody. Thank you for attending this session. Um, research use of the National Web Archives for this year's the IAPC Web Archive and Conference. So um, before I start, I'd like to remind you to use the Q&A session to add your questions for our panelists and vote in your favorite questions. So yes, well, we have had a very interesting selection of presentations. So um, I'll start by introducing our speakers. Um, we have um, Jason Weber with us, uh, the UK Web Archive Engagement Manager, who's based uh, at the British Library. Um, and Jason's here with two PhD students who are employing uh, the collections of the UK Web Archive in their studies. Um, Leanne Markey at the University of Liverpool and Sarah Abdullahi at um, L3S Research Centre of the University of Hanover. And we also have with us um, Martin Nemeth, digital librarian at National Shichenya Library, who will be presenting with Kula Calcio, who's senior lecturer at Esther Hazy Carroll University. Um, if I can ask each speaker to uh, give a summary of their presentations, um, I'll keep an eye on timing and I'll wave my hand if you have a half a minute left. Um, and so um, I'll begin by asking Liam, could I ask you to start us off? Yeah, sure. Uh, so hello everyone, my name's Liam. Um, as mentioned, I work at the University of Liverpool um, with the British Library uh, and my research project, um, it concerns British commemoration and uh, militarism and it centres on the concept of military victimhood. So this basically looks at um, how soldiers within commemorative practices are um, depicted as victims and how this potentially um, well, my, I'm investigating whether this potentially contributes to um, a militaristic ideology. Um, so the, the basis of my project is a critical discourse analysis of a text sample. Um, and I created this sample using um, archival materials from the British Library. Um, because of uh, COVID restrictions, this was kind of dialed back and contains a uh, newspaper text and um, web archive, uh, text from the UK web archive. Um, and what this basically is, is a, a critical investigation into discourse and its potential to sort of uh, perpetuate, uh, reproduce, produce um, a specific social reality. Um, so my main presentation goes into this into a lot more detail, uh, but I'll summarize here kind of um, what my initial analysis of the text samples demonstrated. Um, and it's basically that um, text from the British mainstream media from the three newspapers uh, that I've looked at, the Daily Mail, the Daily Mirror, and the Times. Um, what this shows is kind of uh, a, largely a perpetuation of militaristic ideology, specifically during um, November each year. That's where my text sample um, is, is focused. Um, so, so yeah, we see um, how specific groups of social actors are um, depicted in very positive ways if they're um uh if they have uh, close ties to the military people um such as ex-servicemen um and the war dead themselves um what is interesting is when we look at the web archive texts there's a lot more of a kind of um the, the bigger picture is presented um and there's a lot more opportunity for um kind of what we'd call counter narratives that are demonstrated um, in the mainstream media texts, there's what I've titled a group of social actors that I've titled as the deviant. And basically, this is anyone who sort of uh, counter narrative uh, provides a counter narrative to what the mainstream texts are um, perpetuating. Um, we see that they're vilified heavily, the negative language used. Um, and what this does is it kind of acts as a um, it silences specific viewpoints concerning um, British commemoration. Um, and what we see is with the UK web archive, the, the, the democratic nature of the World Wide Web, there's a lot more opportunity for um, different ideas concerning British commemoration to be expressed. Um, so yeah, that's kind of been the, the thrust of my analysis and research so far is kind of how the web archives allows uh, different avenues into a topic to be explored um, and kind of what this means moving forward and um, being able to collect more websites and what this can tell us about different topics. Thank you very much. Um, and Sarah, could I ask you to summarize your presentation next? 
Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sara. I'm a PhD student in Hanover. Uh, my background is computer science, and I work on uh, building user access models to event centric information. Uh, my presentation here is about my ongoing research uh, in replacement. I work on uh, building uh, event collections from web archives using knowledge graphs. Uh, so uh, working on events for social scientists and uh, researchers uh, which impact our society is very important and web archives are very important because it uh, could uh, represent a perception of the event in their happening time. Uh, but the problem uh, with a web archive, which makes it challenging for uh, working, uh, for researching, is that um, uh, researchers or, or users in general should check all the returned websites uh, for a topic one by one. This could be uh, time consuming. And the solution is using uh, collections for a specific uh, as the main uh, goal of my research. Uh, so as an example, web archives uh, uh, and uh, some of which are about events like Brexit, uh, elections, uh, or other events. Uh, creating these uh, actions uh, by uh, experts and specialists is uh, time consuming, and sometimes uh, it might not cover all um, related information. Uh, so, my research is uh, by automatically uh, creating event, event collections from knowledge graphs. Knowledge graphs are structured uh, information uh, um, which represent concepts, entities, events, people, locations, and the relation they have. Uh, the knowledge graph I use for this research uh, is called Event KG, information about event, different features, different event centric features, and their relations. Uh, this work has two main components. Uh, this knowledge graph to information uh, regarding an events. After collecting all this information, I rank them and I use the most uh, related ones. Uh, after getting all this uh, related information, I create new queries, uh, retrieve related documents from web archives, related web documents. Uh, I create a collection uh, regarding different features an event and then in the second uh, component I use a language model to rank this uh, retrievements to choose the most important one guarding each of these aspects this uh, language model state of the art in document retrieval it's called BERT and um, it's actually uh, uh, it, it learns the representation position of words in text uh, after uh, uh, these collections and after uh, getting um, uh, the ranked final list, top 100 or top 200 uh, websites as the final. Uh, this is an ongoing research and I hope after uh, having all the results, uh, I can get a good evaluation uh, with help of um, uh, my supervisors in to see uh, how it works and how I can work. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> um, Martin, uh, can I ask you to um, begin the presentation for, um, begin rather the summary for your presentation? Yes. Uh, thank you. Very much. I am Mark Martin Német from the National Research Engine Library uh, from Hungary. And uh, uh, our library is uh, collecting nowadays news from 75 news portals in Hungarian language from Hungary and from the neighboring countries really, really related to the Russian Ukrainian war conflict since the uh, 21st of Feb February 2022. The collection is not public, however, by the help of our, our Danish colleague Thomas Egenze, we have created a Solar Wayback based public uh, uh, 
search interface. I will share soon the link. It has uh, just uh, become av available uh, for the wider public today. And uh, by, by, by this service, the full text news in, uh, are not available due to copyright reasons, but uh, there, there is a full text search function and uh, metadata and, and uh, textual context can be also displayed. And from the beginning of March, another thematic collection has, has established by websites and social media sites about Hungarians in the Transcarpathian region in Ukraine. It is currently containing more than 1,000 seed URLs. Uh, our harvests are running uh, one, two times per week for both collections. And uh, this collection also uh, includes those Facebook groups that are being intended to help refugees that have arrived recently uh, to Hungary. And uh, the harvested content as big data is being analyzed in a project we have just formed to, together with by the web archiving team at the, the, the Digital Humanities Research Center within the National Library. Uh, the web archiving team has also become a, a part of the, the Digital Humanities Research Center from the last week. So I'm uh, uh, giving now the speech to my colleague uh, Dula Kalcho, and uh, she and he he will. Uh, uh, summarize this uh, project, the, the, the first results that they have done, already done. Thank you, Martin. I'm Jula Kocsu uh, from the Digital Humanities Center of the National Teaching Library in Hungary. And uh, our task at the Digital Humanities Center was to extract the text from the collected work files of the thematic collection and uh, use um, natural language processing to to build word frequency lists from them, which were used to make word clouds and other types of data visualizations. Uh, text extraction was uh, relatively simple using Python scripts and modules called uh, WarQ and uh, Just Text, although time consuming, but but the natural language processing part was more, much more complex. The production of uh, word clouds uh, basically involves uh, so-called bag of words type text processing, but but in the in the case of Hungarian, it's a much more complex task uh, because Hungarian is an agglutinating conjugative language that that uses suffixes. So uh, to produce, produce uh, word clouds, texts need to be lemmatized and morphologically analyzed. Uh, furthermore, we wanted to process uh, the, the so-called homonymous words separately by part of speech. So, so part of speech tagging was also necessary. Uh, after uh, the natural language processing part, we further process the output by uh, output uh, produced produced by the the so-called EMTSV tool, the natural language processing tool, to produce a part of speech separated frequency lists of lemmata. These lists are after that uh, suitable to be used as a wall or further filtered to produce data visualizations using different tools. Um, a Power BI dashboard, charts, and word clouds have been created and uh, and can can be viewed on, on our website. I I will um, type uh, the URL into the chat later, but uh, but uh, the site uh, currently is uh, unfortunately on available only in Hungarian. Uh, thank you. Great, thank you. 
In fact, I'm sorry, I should apologise first. I, I think I misintroduced you as belonging to another organisation, but you're actually also at the Shechini Library. <laughs> sorry, just to acknowledge that. Um, right, so I think we'll start with some prepared questions that we had ahead of the session. So, um, yeah, so I have one here for, um, for Liam Markey. Um, and um, it's asking, can you see your methodology being used by other researchers looking across newspaper and online material? And would you recommend it? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can do. I think it's it's been a really uh, flexible approach. So it's critical discourse analysis is kind of the, the overarching methodology, but there's a lot of sort of um, sub-disciplinary approaches within that. Um, different types of, uh, you know, um, specifically the one I'm using is called the discourse historical approach because I'm looking at um, the past hundred years from 1918 to 2018 uh, representations of um, British soldiers as victims in commemorative discourse. Um, so this specific approach within um, critical discourse analysis um, that's very heavily um, focused on different um, genres of text so that allowed a lot of uh, flexibility when it came to comparing and contrasting um, the, the newspaper text and the web archive text as I mentioned earlier pre-COVID the plan was to also include a lot more um, a, a lot of different types of objects so kind of physical objects audio things like that and um, so I think definitely critical discourse analysis allows you to really um, to find a way in the, um, to the, a way that suits you whilst also kind of keeping the core tenets of that um, methodological approach um, and yeah there's, there's just a lot of, of scope because I was initially going to use image analysis as well but because of the size of the um, the data I was ex uh, kind of finding through my analysis of just linguistics that's kind of been um, removed for now put in a, a separate document um, so yeah 100% definitely um, a really useful methodological approach. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, and I had uh, another one here for um, for Sarah. Um, how can national web archives be um, compliant with the semantic web, or can you suggest uh, ways that we could better aid research like yours? Yeah. Uh, so, semantic um, web. Uh, we need to help the computers to understand. The information, the queries, and what uh, users want, and uh, different resources and documents uh, exist in the web. Uh, for that, um, if the website, in general, the documents have tags, uh, tag information, date, uh, it really could help uh, with especially with uh, searching and retrieving the results. Uh, so it would be like if uh, a document is talking about uh, Apple company, for example, uh, having the tag of Apple entity as the company would really help the computers to understand it in the search. And it would be really different uh, from considering as the fruit. So knowing the entities um, in addition to their text representation would really help Semantic Web to um, improve the search results in web archives. Mm. So um, just to clarify a little bit, I mean, is that, um, so you see that as being something that would be integrated into the HTML or could it be um, something that the computer scientist could um, perhaps understand from a related catalog record? Is uh, that something? Uh, there, there is a field of entity linking with uh, the entities from text and mm -hmm. tags it, uh, which connects it to um, very public and very uh, knowledge graphs. It could really help with search. And for that, uh, I think, yeah, it could be integrated, uh, but it, it needs a huge uh, um, uh, work on the text and adding entities uh, to all the documents, to all the web documents in web archives. Mm -hmm. But it's standard um, uh, task in information retrieval. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thanks very much. I have a, 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 a kind of vested interest in making um, arguments for doing more cataloguing in web archives. So that's everything, everything that can uh, speak in favour of that I'm interested in. Yeah, so, um, right, okay, moving on. Um, I had um, a question here for um, for either Gula Calcio or for Martin Amos. Um, so you note um, in your presentation that um, your newspaper collections are under copyright, but um, your projects are using Warkio to extract the full text to create derivatives. Yes. And so, um, is data mining therefore allowed under Hungarian law? Do you have a slightly different um, approach to perhaps some other countries in this area? Uh, in in Hungary, the uh, the uh, following the European Union directives, mm -hmm. the copyright law has modified, uh, re, 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 recently modified and and uh, we we have much more opportunities for for uh, the data mining and the text uh, mining uh, re research as as uh, b before uh, so it's a it's a uh, more positive uh, situation and uh, and furthermore as we are we are we, we are work, working together with the digital human humanities researchers within the library so so we we can use all the resources without restrictions but but i would like to refer again that the the full text resources have not become available be, 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 be due, due, due to copyright reasons. We mm -hmm. just uh, uh, can publish uh, the results of the analysis and we have uh, created this uh, solo way back interface where the playback for the full text search has been disabled in the con configuration by default, as, as I mentioned in the the, the summary, so on, only the the context that the search for the full text elements is available. That is the compromise we have to follow due, due to the legal environment. Um, yeah, I had a, a quick follow up again for either of um, for either of you. Um, there's a I was, I was just intrigued by one of the slides which was showing um, the kind of um, search for a number of political terms, and um, because it's a picture, I couldn't put it into a, a machine translator to see what they meant. I don't know if you recall offhand what any of those um, terms you were searching were for. Um, I would just be pretty interested to know. Oh, uh, we are apologizing for that. Uh, may I share uh, my screen to show uh, the diagram? Oh, I don't know. One, maybe one of our um, our helpers can pop something in the chat if that's possible. Um, mm -hmm. No, you will not be able to share your screen. Sorry about okay. that. OK, uh, but, but you can. Uh, uh, Search, search search for the diagram on the uh, on the web page I I shared uh, in in the chat window. Uh, so on the second diagram, um, um, uh, you can see politics related uh, uh, words uh, um, and the change of um, the frequency of frequency of words by the time. Um, the chart itself is just an illustration of, uh, of how we created thematic diagrams, thematic charts. Um, words from any topic can be selected. Uh, these happen to be politics related words like um, positions. Uh, Minister Elnök is, is for Prime Minister, Alam Titkar, Secretary of State. Uh, minister in Hungarian is a minister of foreign affairs. So, so these are these all are 
one word in Hungarian, but there are uh, also abstract entities on, on the chart um, yeah. with the words power, responsibility, interest, solidarity, or other entities like territory, migrants, sanction, negotiation, um, and so on. Um, it can be seen, for example, that the frequency of uh, power, which is the eru in Hungarian on the chart, and the uh, sanction, which, which is um, tsongtiu, increased together at the end of February uh, when the newspapers reported that the sanctions uh, to be imposed were, were a demonstration of power. Or you can see the... the the frequency of word migrant slowly increases by by time. That's it. Great, thank you very much. And thank you, Olga, for sharing the slides. Um, good. OK, well, I think we should probably try and move on to the Q&A um, because we do have a couple of questions in here from our audience. So they're both from Liam so far, so I'll just pick the first one. And um, so uh, what role do you think the Ministry of Pensions had in silencing the dissidents to the mainstream narrative of war or encouraging the mainstream narrative? Um, that's quite an interesting question because because of the scope of the project being over 100 years, it's kind of something that uh, changes as it goes along. So I can't speak directly for the Ministry of Pensions, but I know um, after the First World War, the care for uh, specifically kind of disabled ex-servicemen um, or the or people who had lost loved ones kind of the the breadwinners of the family um, were very kind of um, reliant on public charity because the government weren't as willing as other nations for example Germany um, to kind of pay in full the the money needed there by disabled ex-servicemen for example um, so initially it, when there are so many um, people in the, the population in Britain who are reliant on financial support um, and the Ministry of Pensions aren't given that. What, what we see in the text is ex-servicemen are really heavily depicted as victims. And what this does is this is kind of, uh, this was uh, a method of letting the, the public know um, that these are people who need your help. Um, and it was very, very sympathetic depictions um, so in terms of the Ministry of Pensions kind of um, trying to uh, silence this sort of uh, view of the ex-servicemen as victims, I'd say there, are, there isn't evidence directly of those speaking because of the nature of the, the text that I've collected, but that was kind of in their favour. When ex-servicemen were depicted as victims, um, it took a lot of pressure off them because people were very willing to kind of go out the way, you know, to purchase a poppy. And there's lots of texts specifically from the newspapers that talk about um, goods made by disabled ex-servicemen, why you should buy them over kind of, um, you know, uh, mass produced goods, um, all that sort of thing. But as um, one of the things within the, the project that's become quite important is once that um, people uh, who fought in kind of total war, once that uh, population is reduced and we have a lot more uh, sorry, a, a lot fewer people who have served in a war, have been disabled by war, especially towards the end of the 20th and into the 21st century. Um, the kind of sympathetic depiction of ex-servicemen kind of starts to disappear and it's replaced with more of a kind of um, this view of ex-servicemen being able to sort of become more than a man, uh, more than the man that they were before they were left disabled. And it's because of being victims that they sort of, um, there's this idea of kind of redemption and they transcend victimhood. Um, so again, not, not strictly relating to the Ministry of Pensions because they're not very um, present within the sample itself. Whenever they are mentioned, it's kind of, um, I think the main mentions around the 60s and 70s when um, elderly, well, ex-servicemen from the First World War become elderly and their pensions aren't kind of enough to support them. There's a lot of talk about how Second World War veterans get a better pension than First World War. Um, but yeah, in terms of kind of the, the texts themselves do a lot of the heavy lifting for the Ministry of Pensions because they are sort of propaganda or kind of an advert for the public to 
do the ministry's job for them and kind of give the money from their own pocket rather than from the government. So yeah, they definitely, it changes through time, but when there is a large amount of people in the population who, who need financial support from the Ministry of Pensions, um, I think it's safe to say that they'd be in favour of kind of these depictions because it, yeah, it did, did their job for them. Right, thanks Liam. Um, right, we had, as I was saying, uh, one more for you. Um, and firstly, apologies to Megan Lyon, you actually had, um, I should have had things organised by most upvotes, but um, so her question was, I like how you pull text from newspapers for your analysis and used a sort of close reading approach to analysing the text. Did you also pull and analyse text from the web archives? And if so, how do you go about it and what mechanisms did you use for analysis? Um, so yeah, so I basically the same approach as with the newspaper texts um, I do, did with the web archive texts. Um, so I used Envivo as kind of my database to collect um, these texts so that I could code and cross-reference them all in, in, in one place for ease of access. Um, and that allowed me, um, there's an extension for Chrome, um, NCAPTCHA it's called. Uh, and what this does is it basically just it directly imports the website that you're on um, in the Chrome browser into Envivo. Um, and then from there, yeah, it was the exact same kind of process, was a, just a, a close reading of the text themselves. Um, and what I was specifically looking for um, within my methodology, there's kind of three main, um, what are called the scarce of strategies. Um, so there's nomination and predication. So that's basically um, the naming of someone. So literally, what word is used to describe someone uh, and the predication is to do with whether this is a positive or a negative name. Uh, so I was specifically looking for mention of any kind of social actors who were uh, integral to British commemorative practices. So from that, it was apparent that it was um, the war dead, uh, the bereaved and ex-servicemen were kind of the three main um, groups that were talked about. Um, so yeah, so firstly it was, I'd, closely read the, the website text itself. And whenever there was um, mention made of one of these groups, I'd kind of code that and stick it to one side. Um, and then there's also uh, a discursive strategy called transitivity. And this is to do with um, objects and actors. And um, so within a text, um, if there is kind of an action being done, it's who is doing what and to whom. Um, so in terms of kind of to, to again go back to um, ex-servicemen, we find that, well, I found that a lot of this transitive process was ex-servicemen were always the object. They were always having something done to them. Um, and what this did was highlight their kind of um, passivity, which is uh, a character trait that's heavily connected to the idea of being a victim. Um, so, yeah, those were the three kind of um, strategies that I went about is just yeah, it was, it took a while, but it was just reading each website and whenever one of these instances of a discursive strategy being used, um, it was to kind of lift it from the text. And then um, you kind of, within the, the analysis itself, it's hard to discern then the newspaper from the uh, web text. And that kind of was really useful then because you can get to the core, the, the core issue of like the use of language and um, it didn't really matter the genre it was coming from in the end. It was kind of just, here's some evidence of this is how this topic um, it talked about. Thank you very much. I think um, we're waiting for a few more questions come through from the Q&A. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you, we have quite a broad question, and I'd just like to ask um, the researchers in the panel to reflect on um, what have been the most, um, what are the most, what do you see as being the opportunities of working with a national web archive? And um, possibly some of the challenges as well. Does anyone want to come in on that? Mm -hmm. Unless that's a bit too 
bit too open, we, maybe. <laughs> yeah, we we can experience many kind of uh, challenges in this. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah, the uh, the uh, legal challenge. Uh, this 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 part of of the uh, new new law is uh, still really sig 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 significant as as we can't pro provide the full text content to the the end uh, users. But but at at uh, least some new op op opportunities are emerging by 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 this kind of data visual visualizations and uh, and uh, and new new uh, analyzing uh, methods that that, uh, that our the the digital humanities colleagues are using and i think it will be a key point that uh, how can uh, can the uh, web the thematic and even based web archive collections that 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 are in work files can uh, that so how can these be used for national language processing and uh, and uh, and and for uh, uh, various uh, more uh, and and uh, analyzing methods because somehow we we have to present to the wider public why we are uh, uh, working and and then what what is the social significance of uh, our job and 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 it's a it's a really challenging question but with these tools at at least we we can rep represent some the results and 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 we 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 can rep, rep represent a, a major social goal of um, uh, of the existence of the archive collections yes thanks for that i think um it is so difficult to kind of um yeah it's just like um when you're trying to look at how to actually represent what um the state of you know what's published in the open web in your um the area of your country is so difficult to kind of know how to approach well sharing it and visualizing it and um uh making it really research ready as it were and kind of um the on the one hand uh, the the fact of being a national archive can kind of give you a great deal of scope because you can collect i mean with a legal deposit which I think is everyone's situation here. You can have a great deal of um, ability to collect, but then sharing and actually presenting the material is the big question. Um, but you can kind of see where um, there's potential for, um, you know, wonderful work like um, uh, research come out of it. And really, I mean, I suppose we're still kind of quite early on. I don't know if anybody else had any particular um, favourite challenges or opportunities they wanted to remark on. Or I may go on to another question uh, I had. Sorry, oh Liam. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it was one of the biggest challenges is kind of, because I was looking at web and newspaper, with the newspaper, the, the way I looked at it was between the 7th and the 14th of November, every 10 years. Um, so in that instance, you've only really got, because of the three newspapers, you've got uh, over seven days, 21 newspapers to look at. And it's quite, you know, you're quite a contained thing. There's only one newspaper from each publication a day. Whereas with the web archive, you kind of put these search parameters in and you've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of results. And that was kind of probably the most interesting, but also the most challenging part was working out how to, um, how do I cut this down? and you know kind of having to validate your own reasoning behind why you're choosing to cut this down and you didn't want it to i didn't want it to be too um sort of biased and it kind of cherry picking websites that i knew would be useful for me um so that was kind of one of the biggest sort of hurdles to overcome was trying to um yeah find find that right balance and 
cutting down the sample size to a manageable selection of texts. And yeah, I think that's the thing with the web archive is because it's so big, it, it is quite daunting working out. Yeah. How do you, where do you start and how do you go from there? And how do you, um, yeah, make your mind up on what to leave on the cutting room floor? And the, the, the bigger challenge, but also, yeah, once you kind of do get through there and you've got something at the end, that's the most sort of rewarding part of it. Great, thank you. Um, I think we've got time for um, one more question. Um, Claire Newing is um, asking both Sarah and Liam, what made you decide to use a web archive for your research? Um, how much did you know about web archives before you started as well? Um, yeah, maybe answer this. Uh, so uh, before working on this project, um, I was mainly focused on computer science and working with, uh, I mean, numbers. <laughs> but then uh, after starting uh, this research uh, in a multidisciplinary group, uh, I started to uh, see web archives and uh, to see how it's useful for uh, researchers in other fields, such as social science uh, and history. Um, and uh, uh, I think it's uh, really interesting to see uh, how my D and how my research could have effect uh, in uh, making uh, interaction models for researchers uh, to work, work with uh, information from um, web archives and other sources in general. Uh, yeah, I mean, before I started this PhD, I was kind of applying to do one in the history department at my uni, kind of like a self-funded one. Um, so I'd never, never thought about using a web archive until it, because, because I'm a case student, I kind of interviewed for the position of my PhD. So rather than kind of writing the uh, kind of proposal myself, it was sort of written by my current supervisors. Um, so until I've kind of applied and been accepted, I'd never kind of even really thought about web archives before. So it was kind of like, yeah, just kind of jumping in the deep end and coming down to the British Library every couple of months for a week um, to meet with Jason and the UK web archive team. And it was kind of, yeah, it's just been a, a learning process throughout the PhD, uh, kind of the importance and the, the uses of web archives. But yeah, um, so it was kind of not my decision strictly speaking to sort of use the web archive but it's been something that's been made made the project a lot more kind of unique and interesting being able to access this sort of untapped resource largely untapped uh, resource yeah that's great thanks so much really just thank you to the panel for giving such useful insight into your research and into your archives and um, thank you to our audience for attending for asking really good questions <laughs>